Well, brothers and sisters, I invite you to open your Bibles with me to the letter of Paul to the Romans. The letter of Paul to the Romans, chapter 1. If you've been uh, attending our discipleship hour in the morning, you know that Pastor Briggs has just finished his series on evangelism and talking about the content of the gospel and how we are to evangelize. And so I thought it would be fitting for us to consider this passage this evening, Romans chapter 1 and verses 15 to 17. And just for context, I, I want to begin reading in verse 8. Romans chapter 1, beginning in verse 8. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you, because your faith is proclaimed in all the world. For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I mention you always in my prayers, asking that somehow by God's will I may now at last succeed in coming to you. For I long to see you, that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to strengthen you, that is, that we may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith, both yours and mine. I want you to know, brothers, that I have often intended to come to you, but thus far have been prevented, in order that I may reap some harvest among you as well as among the rest of the Gentiles. I am under obligation both to Greek and to barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish. So I am eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. This is the word of the living God. Let us go to heaven in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time of uh, being able to gather as your people to worship you. Lord, we thank you for your word which speaks with such clarity and power with, with your, by your spirit into our hearts. We thank you, Lord, that you have not left us in silence, that you have revealed yourself through the person and work of Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord, for, for this letter which has been handed down throughout the thousands of years now and that we are able to open it up and to glean from the wisdom which you have revealed to your apostle Paul. And so Lord we pray that you would open our hearts even now to receive your word, to receive your truth and to apply it into our lives. Lord give me the clarity of thought and, and uh, help me to speak your truth faithfully for your glory in Christ's name. Amen. Well, it is no secret that Romans, along with the book of uh, Hebrews and Galatians, are crucial books, were crucial books for the Protestant Reformation. It was through reading these books that the leaders of the Reformation came to understand the meaning of the gospel, came to understand the, the righteousness of God, that justification is by faith alone, that it is through faith in Christ, that we can actually have peace with God now in this world. And it is Romans, it is Romans that is written by Paul that presents for us the, the gospel in a most comprehensive and a most systematic kind of way. Now, Romans is not a systematic theology, but Paul does present the gospel here in with, most, with the most clarity, most systematically. But his, his uh, desire in writing the book is to encourage the saints. You notice how he says it in verse 11, that he longs to see them, to impart some spiritual gift and to strengthen them. You see, Paul wants the Christian, Christian believer not only to know the content of the gospel, but to also experience its power. As he wrote also to the Thessalonians that we were ready to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves, because you had become very dear to us. 1 Thessalonians 2.8 A love for the message of God and a love for the people of God 
was the focus and the desire of Paul's ministry. Now, who are the Romans? The church in Rome has already been well established when Paul was writing this letter. We read in Acts 2 when many people from all over the world gathered on that great day, the day of Pentecost. And when Peter preached that great message of salvation, repentance, and faith in Jesus Christ, there were people there also who came from Rome. And they believed the message, they received it, they they went back to their hometown and, and established a church there and continued the ministry there in the capital of the Roman Empire. But Paul himself never visited Rome. Not yet. And he says he, he desires to in verse 13. But in the providence of God to this point he has been prevented. What I want to notice, want, want us to notice here first of all is the motivation. The motivation which Paul has for going to Rome. Remember that Rome is, is the center of the world. It has not yet reached the heights of its splendor. The Colosseum would not be built for another decade or so. But nonetheless, Rome was the greatest city of the time. It was the center of power and government. It was there where all the famous people would go. People would go all around from all around the world would come to see this great city. And yet, that is not what attracts Paul to Rome. Notice what he says. He says that he desires to see the saints. He, he's, not, he's not so much concerned about the, the city and its splendor. You know, he doesn't say, now, brothers and sisters, when I do get to Rome, you know, I, I'd really want you to give me a tour of the great city. You know, I, I really long to see all the famous people who gather there. I, I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing the Palace of Augustus. I, I'm really looking forward to see the great uh, chariot racing stadium. No, no. He desires to see the saints themselves. I, I long to see you, to strengthen you, brothers, to be mutually encouraged in our faith. You see, here is a man who did not exaggerate when he said that for me to live is Christ. For me to live as Christ. And, and this is what he wanted to see in all the believers. That also it would be their desires that Christ would be formed in them. And the question for us this evening is, is this something that we also can affirm? Is this our great desire that Christ would be formed in us and that we would see Christ formed in our brothers and sisters? What are we really motivated by, motivated by in our lives? What, what drives us, what stirs us up in our lives? Is it the gospel of Christ? Is it the glory of God? I submit to you, beloved, that nothing so hinders, nothing so hinders our evangelism efforts as having a double-minded spirit. We know the truth. We, we believe it. We're, we're not living in any particular sin, but we have been distracted by the world and the aroma of Christ which was once was so great and and so and so pleasing to us has begun to wane and the fire which once burned so brightly in our bones has all but been extinguished and so the eagerness to preach the gospel is all but lost and the antidote the, the symptom the antidote for the symptom is having a gospel-saturated life, having a Christ-centered life. And so this evening, I want to consider with you three marks, three marks which we see from the Apostle Paul that characterized a gospel-saturated life. Paul says in verse 15 that he is eager to preach the gospel. Paul even says earlier in verse 14 that he is under obligation to preach the gospel. You know, one thing you can be sure of is that Paul was not about friendship evangelism, or as it is sometimes called, pre-evangelism. The idea that I must first become a friend of somebody, and then maybe perhaps after months or, or even sometimes years after re- establishing a relationship, a friendship, I will uh, eventually get to Christ with him. I will eventually tell him uh, what's the most, what, what is the most important thing in my life. You see the contradiction 
Imagine it's your friend Bob who just moved in next door. And uh, you've already spoken to Bob about everything. You've uh, spoken to him about your families. You've spoken to him about your work and children and your hobbies. And then a year into your relationship, you, you decide it's time now to reveal to Bob who you really are. And uh, what do you think Bob would react when after a year he, he finds out wh what really drives you, what really motivates you? You know, I, uh, I am sure, I am confident, if, if not consciously, then Bob would subconsciously question how much you really believe what you're, you say you believe. I mean, you waited all this time to tell me that my eternal destiny is at stake. You waited all this time to tell me the most important message that anybody must hear. I, I don't believe it. Oh, he might not say it, but he'll think about it. And if he won't think about it, he will definitely be motivated by that thought not to take you so seriously. And he might even feel cheated that you've been keeping this scheme in your mind to really just have a fri friendship in order to eventually get him on the hook, so to speak. But not so with the Apostle Paul. He says he is eager to preach the gospel. You know, if, if Bob moved in next to Paul, you can be sure that whether it was his family, his friends, his hobbies, politics, Paul would find Christ in every conversation. He, he could not keep himself from speaking about Christ. For I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified, says Paul to the Corinthians. And brothers and sisters, there's so many ways that we can do this as well. You know, when your unbelieving neighbor says, shares a good news with you, even something like, oh, the weather is great outside, or, you know, I, I, my, my wife just gave birth to, or, to a son. Don't be afraid to say, praise God, and say it with sincerity and confidence. Not because he can praise God. Yes, he's an unbeliever, and he's, uh, he's uh, suppressing the truth and unrighteousness, but, but he ought to praise God. He ought to praise God, and you are calling him to praise God. And that could be a, a, a door to, to speaking about Christ. What do you mean praise God? Well, why would I praise God? God didn't do this. My wife did. Well, because children are an inheritance of the Lord. And, and we're created to praise God and to give thanks for him for everything. And, and we don't do it, but why? And there's your entryway. You see, this eagerness this eagerness to, to preach the gospel is a characteristic mark of a, of a person who has a gospel-centered life. It's an eagerness to see fallen so souls become worshipers of God. And notice how Paul puts it. He, he doesn't say, I am eager to share the gospel with you. He says, I am eager to preach the gospel you know, never does the Bible speak about sharing the gospel. It does speak about preaching, persuading, proclaiming, but never sharing. Acts 4.2, they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. Acts 19.8, and he, that is Paul, entered the synagogue and continued speaking out boldly for three months reasoning and persuading them about the kingdom of God. 2 Corinthians 5.11, Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade men. 1 John 1, 2 and 3, And we have seen and testify and proclaim to you the eternal life. You see, in the broader sense, we are all to preach the gospel. Not only the person who stands behind the pulpit. We are all called to preach the gospel. And I understand, we, we've been preconditioned to this. It's like we say that, well, I'm going to church today. Well, you're not going to church. You're going to a church gathering. You're going to worship with the body of Christ. And likewise, we are not sharing the gospel. We should be preaching the gospel. You see, the idea, the expression of sharing the gospel tends to inculcate the idea that it's something that belongs to me, and here I'm sharing it with you. We share testimonies. We share, you know, our food, but we preach the gospel. It is a message given to us by God, which we are to proclaim and to declare to others. Now, I don't want to make a, too much of a deal about this, but I, I do want to encourage you to try to use biblical terminology uh, in whatever field 
you are whatever area of theology or life you are addressing. So we, are des- we, we should desire to, to preach the gospel. You know, the idea of sharing the gospel also robs the, 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 the preaching of go- the gospel of its urgency. Urgency. There is urgency to the gospel. We, we want people to know about Christ and what he has done. So preach the gospel. Now, when we say preach the gospel, I, I just want to clarify that we don't, do not mean that we should do it pugnaciously or condescendingly. The gospel is not about making people just feel miserable. Indeed, there are people who preach Christ out of envy. Paul spoke about it. No, but the gospel is, as Spurgeon put it, one beggar telling another beggar where to find bread. One beggar telling another beggar where to find bread. There is no pride. There, there is no self-confidence in this. This is something that God has entrusted to us. To us, And we are, we are preaching it. We are declaring it to others. And notice also in verse 15 that it is believers to whom the apostle Paul is ready to preach. I am ready to preach to you also who are in Rome. You see, believers need to hear the gospel too. We need to rid ourselves of this false notion that once I become a Christian, I no longer need to hear the gospel. Once I become a Christian, the gospel is only for the unbeliever. unbeliever. Now we are to be continually conformed into the image of Christ, and that comes through the gospel. The image of Christ is to be reflected in us, and that is a, a lifelong process. And part of being conformed to the image of Christ is, is becoming better evangelists. And the reason we can find it so difficult to evangelize others is because we don't evangelize ourselves enough. We don't evangelize others because we don't evangelize ourselves. Because, again, we have this notion that the gospel is only for the unbeliever. You see, when we, we do have this proper perspective, when we do remind ourselves of our own need of Christ every single day, and we see that He is not only sufficient to save us and to justify us, but to sustain us in our lives, we we will have an eagerness. We will have a boldness to speak Christ and the gospel to others. Do you have the eagerness to preach the gospel? As He is so lovely and so beautiful in your sight that, that you seek to proclaim Him to others, even to other believers. Paul did. We cannot be half-hearted about this, beloved. We must be ready to preach the gospel with eagerness and boldness. And so a gospel-saturated life is a life which is characterized by eagerness, readiness, and urgency to preach Christ crucified, resurrected, ascended to glory, and returning in the choosing of His Father's time. But not only is there an urgency to preach the gospel, we see in verse 16 that a gospel-centered life is secondly characterized by a confidence in its message. The Apostle Paul says that I am not ashamed of the gospel. And these two ideas, uh, urgency, eagerness, and, and confidence, of course, are, they go hand in hand. They are related ideas. Of course, if you are eager to preach, The gospel, we assume that you have the confidence in its message. But why does Paul put it negatively? I am not ashamed of the gospel. In his second imprisonment, when he will be writing to Timothy, he says to Timothy also these similar words. says, Timothy, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord. 2 Timothy 1.8. Why would there be any reason to be ashamed of the gospel or to be ashamed of the Lord? Well, on the one hand, Paul had every reason to be ashamed of the gospel. After all, he he surely knew that Rome would be hostile to Christ. He knew that they were steeped in emperor worship. He knew that they would reject the exclusivity of Christ. You know, the pagans in Rome actually branded Christians as atheists because they did not believe in the pantheon of the Greek gods. 
Christians had no shrines or, or temples. They had no images or altars or, or sacrificial rites or priesthood. So as far as the pagans were concerned, these people were just atheists. They didn't believe in God. Look, they, they're not practicing. What do we practice? And some even called them cannibals because they spoke of drinking blood and eating flesh, referring to our Lord's Supper. And so the Apostle Paul understood very well that the Christians in Rome were facing this opposition. And more importantly, he understood that the gospel in and of itself has an offense to the natural man. The gospel is offensive to the natural man. And so people who do not believe it, they tend to ridicule it. The natural man ridicules the gospel. The Greeks especially consider, it, consider the gospel nothing but foolishness. You remember what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 1.18, For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing. That word folly is the word from which we get the word moron. It's moronic to those who are perishing. And then in verse 23, Paul says that a Christ who is crucified is folly to the Gentiles. And the gospel has always been always been a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. Now, I don't believe that Paul himself ever was ashamed of the gospel, but I do believe that he had the temptation to be ashamed of the gospel. You remember his uh, encounter with the, with the Greek, philosopher, Greek philosophers in Acts chapter 17 when he was in Athens, where he too was ridiculed for preaching the gospel of Christ. They said, what does this babbler this seed picker want to tell us? Who would believe in a cru crucified Savior? Who would believe in a resurrection? Really, God became man? Now, this was a, in complete contradiction to all that they believed. And so the natural man ridicules the gospel. And you know, we don't like to be ridiculed, right? We don't, we don't like to be ridiculed. And so what happens? We, well, we are tempted to be ashamed of it. We are tempted to be ashamed of the gospel because we do not, we, we fear of the consequences of preaching the gospel. But Paul says, I am not ashamed. I am eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. Why do we ever get ashamed? Well, I think we, we become ashamed when our actions contradict and accept a norm. And too often this accepted norm is the norm of popular opinion and not the opinion of God. Too often we, we think more of what others will say and not what God will think. And so what do we do then? We compromise. We, we conform to popular opinion. We try to remove the offense of the cross. We try to trim off the rough edges. We try to make the gospel more palatable, attractive to the flesh. We speak less of sin and condemnation. We moralize the gospel. We psycholog psychologize the gospel. Or we even substitute preaching for mercy ministry. One commentator puts it this way. The unpopularity of a crucified Christ was, has always promoted has promoted many to present a message which is more palatable to the unbeliever. But the removal of the offense of the cross always renders the message ineffective. An inoffensive gospel is also an inoperative gospel. Thus, Christianity is wounded most in the house of its friends. You see, if you are to live a gospel-saturated life, if you are to have the boldness of the Apostle Paul, you cannot be ashamed of the offense of the cross. That comes part and parcel of the message. Remember the, the words of our Lord, that whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. angels. Mark 8, 38. Remember that the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. The wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. So that is to put it negatively, why Paul is not ashamed. But more importantly, 
Look what he says next. This, this is the real reason why Paul is not ashamed of the gospel. It is because he recognizes it to be the power of God to salvation. The power of God to salvation. So thirdly, a gospel-saturated life is marked by the power of God. I am not ashamed of the gospel, says Paul, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. You do recognize here that what we are talking about, when we are talking about the gospel, we are not only talking about or merely talking about a certain perspective, a certain, a certain philosophy of life. We are talking here about the power of God being manifest. And that's why a, a moralized gospel is not a gospel at all. It is the power of God. That's why I'm not ashamed. It is the power of God to save sinners. It is the power of God to bring peace to everyone who believes, both Jew and Gentile, to transform lives. That is why I am not ashamed of the gospel. The power of the gospel is in its word and its message. Hebrews 4.12 says that the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. The gospel is powerful because it is the word of God. The gospel is powerful because it is through it that God exercises his power. It is a message which brings salvation to all those who believe. And most importantly, the gospel is powerful because in and through it, in and through the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. The righteousness of God is revealed. You see it there in verse 17. You see, this is the great theme of the entire book of Romans. After this point in the epistle, Paul will go on to explain how it is that the righteousness of God is being revealed. What is it and how is it revealed? And it is in our understanding or in our misunderstanding of the righteousness of God that will determine whether we understand or misunderstand the gospel itself. So the question which we must ask is what kind of a righteousness is the Apostle Paul speaking of here? I want to condense this discussion because there are, there's a lot of discussion being the centra- central verse of uh, Romans. Uh, some people say that the righteousness of God of, of which the Apostle Paul is speaking ha- here is nothing more than an attribute of God. That is, The righteousness of God is simply who He is. The righteousness of God is that He is just. That's all that Paul is trying to say. And there is grounds for this argument in Romans 3, 5. uh, The Apostle Paul says that our righteousness serves to show the righteousness of God, that is His attribute of righteousness, that He exercises righteousness. And then the wrath of God, which will be explained in in verse 18 of chapter 1 and following, also is an expression of God's righteousness. The righteousness of God is revealed. The wrath is is an expression of God's righteousness. And so both grammatically and theologically, the righteousness of God as an attribute of of God is, is a true concept. But the only problem with this position is that we have not yet got to the gospel. We have not yet got to the good news of the gospel. And the righteousness of which the apostle speaks of here is a righteousness of good news. It's a righteousness of the gospel, of the power of the gospel. If Paul is speaking here merely about an attribute of God, how is it then the power of God to salvation? If if all are sinful, and as Romans chapter 3 concludes, not even one seeks after God, how is the righteousness of God as merely being an attribute of God good news? Well, the truth truth is, is that it's not good news. And so the righteousness of which the Apostle Paul must be speaking of here is a righteousness, which again is the power of God unto salvation. He is here speaking of a different righteousness altogether. A righteousness which was promised by God and, and expected by the prophets of old. I want you 
want to, you to open to Psalm chapter, uh, Psalm 98 and verse 1 and 2. Psalm 98, verses 1 and 2. And notice how, how the psalmist speaks about the righteousness of God and how it, it relates to the salvation of God. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm have worked salvation for him. The Lord has made known his salvation. He has revealed his righteousness in the sight of the nations. Or consider, consider Isaiah chapter 46, verse 13. I bring near my righteousness, says the Lord. It is not far off. And my salvation will not be delayed. And I will grant salvation in Zion and my glory for Israel. Or Isaiah 56, 1. Thus says the Lord, preserve justice and do righteousness for my salvation is about to come and my righteousness to be revealed. You see, God has promised a righteousness that is in relationship to salvation, not in relationship to condemnation. And it is this righteousness of which the psalmist and, and the prophets spoke in many different places. And here in Romans chapter 1, verse 17, again, it is this righteousness of which the Apostle Paul speaks. And not only as a promise of the future, but a righteousness which has been revealed. If you go back to Romans and Romans chapter 3, verses 21 to 26, uh, give us the key to understanding how the Apostle Paul is speaking of the righteousness of God. He says in chapter 3, verse 21, But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. Although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption of through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus verse 25 whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith this was to show God's righteousness this is the righteousness because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins and finally verse 26 it was to show his righteousness, God's righteousness, at the present time so that he might be the just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. The just and the justifier. You see, that's where the righteousness of God takes on this double meaning. Yes, God is just in executing his righteousness, but he is just and merciful in giving us his righteousness through faith in Jesus Christ. That is why the revelation of the righteousness of God is the power of God to salvation. It is not only a characteristic of who God is, but it is also a revelation of what God does. Namely, that God imparts righteousness to sinners. And this is the glorious news of the gospel. You know, when Luther, Martin Luther, came to understand this truth, he came to understand the power of God. Because for years, he, his conscience was tormented. He understood the righteousness of God as nothing more than that righteousness which God reveals upon sinners for their sin. And as he came to understand the righteousness of God for what it is here in Romans chapter 1, 17, he says that there I begin to understand that the righteousness of God is revealed by the gospel. Namely, the passive righteousness with which the merciful God justifies us by faith. Here I felt I was altogether born again. And the very gates of paradise opened before me. Luther experienced the power of the gospel. Luther experienced the justifying work of God on behalf of him through Jesus Christ. Oh, brothers and sisters, what, what freedom would we have if we would but take hold of this truth, that we are given the righteousness of God, 
through Jesus Christ? What, what freedom would we have to evangelize those who are lost around us? Knowing that by faith they too can receive that righteousness. righteousness. So a gospel-saturated life is a life which recognizes that God justifies sinners. A life that recognizes there is power in the gospel. And therefore, it is not a shame to preach it. Therefore, it is moved by the empowerment of God to, to preach it to those who are lost. We must be eager to preach the gospel. We must be confident in its message. And we must understand and live in light of its power. If you are here this evening, brother or sister, and I know there are many of us who, who at times struggle with finding the motivation to, to preach the gospel to others. I, I want to encourage you by looking at this man, Paul, and ask yourself the question, what drove Paul to be so courageous, to be so bold for Christ. You see, Paul understood he has the righteousness of God, but he was also motivated by the glory of God, a holy zeal for his name to be praised. That's what motivated Paul. That's why he says he's under obligation to preach, as we're all under obligation to preach, but this obligation comes from a desire to see God glorified. Evangelism exists because worship does not. To put a twist on a popular phrase. Evangelism exists because worship does not. Ask yourself this question. If, if you are, when you are tempted to not evangelize, do you rejoice when you see people glorifying God? Do you find joy when you see people glorifying God? Well, if you do, then you are to evangelize. If you enjoy seeing God being glorified, then you will preach the gospel. Because as we preach the gospel, worshipers are added into the kingdom of God and we rejoice. Be motivated by the glory of God, a holy zeal for His name. And he will give you the power to, to be bold for him. To have courage on behalf of Christ. And for the offense of the gospel. Which is an offense for those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God, is it not? And if you are here this evening and you are not a believer. And you do not yet know Christ. And yet perhaps even now the spirit of God is convicting you. We do not ask you to walk the aisle or to sign a, a card. But even today, this evening, you can repent of your sins and believe in Him. And God promises to everyone who puts their faith in Christ that He will accept you. Recognize your sin and don't just recognize it, repent of it. Say, Lord, I, I recognize that there is nothing good in me. Oh, I am but a wretched sinner. Be merciful to me. Be merciful to me. And then look to Christ. Look to Christ who has took, taken the penalty upon himself. Who has lived a perfect life. A life that you could never live. And died a death which you could never die. And then lifted, was raised to, to glory. Ascended to his father, to the right of his father. In the glory and high. And, and he will return. He will return. And, and the hope of the gospel... It's not only that you, will, you, can have, you can be saved in the future, but you can have the first fruits of your salvation here in this life. When you put your faith in Christ, He will bring peace to you. He will give you His righteousness. I pray that today would be the day of salvation for you, dear friend. Brothers and sisters, Again, I just want to encourage us to, to be bold for Christ. We long to see God being worshipped. We long to see God being exalted. And look around. 
Look around our city, our nation. Is that really happening? Is that really what we are observing and seeing on the news? No, God is mocked. We speak of faith as it's just something that belongs to you and not as an objective reality which God has spoken of. And so if we long to see God worship and exalted, may we leave this building and wherever we go into our families, into our workplaces, let us be zealous for God's gospel. The gospel of God through which he shows his righteousness, to, through which he shows his power by faith in Jesus Christ. Let us not be ashamed. Let us be bold for Christ. And he promises to bless our labors. He promises to give us strength when we are powerless. I pray that that would be the case for all of us. May God give us strength to live all of our lives for his glory. Amen. Our Heavenly Father, we are weak, but you are strong. God, you are to be exalted among all the nations. And yet, Lord, we, we, we mourn because we, we do not see you being worshipped. Lord, we, we long to see your churches filled. We long to see Christ to be exalted amongst the peoples of all the world. And so, Lord, we pray that you would give us a zeal for your truth. Give us an eagerness to preach of Christ and him crucified. Let us not be ashamed, Lord, but let us be bold. Let us be courageous. Give us the power of the Spirit, Lord. Only you can do it. Help us to look to Christ. Help us to remember what we have in him. That we might live in light of the truth. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.